A floundering economy, boatloads of refugees arriving on Australian shores and the spectre of international terrorism. Familiar themes, but from another time. Secret cabinet records from the 1978 Fraser government were declassified today, after 30 years locked away in the National Archives. The papers document the emergence of then new Treasurer John Howard as he struggled to rein in a ballooning deficit. 30 years on, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser says it's a cautionary tale for the Rudd government as it tries to spend its way out of the current financial crisis. Daniel Parry reports. It was the year Cold Chisel made its recording debut and the Commodore replaced the Kingswood as Holden's family sedan. One of the brand new models would set buyers back $6,500. The average wage was about $200 a week. A beer cost 24 cents and a carton of milk 25. For the newly re-elected Fraser government, the flagging economy was the primary challenge going into 1978. The economy is still in bad shape and that comes through very strongly in the, in the Cabinet papers. But within weeks, economic concerns were overshadowed by the arrival of terrorism on Australian shores. 10 o'clock on the 13th of the 2nd, 1978, the day Australia was blasted into the world of international terrorism. A bomb had been planted in a garbage bin outside Sydney's Hilton Hotel where the Prime Minister was hosting a meeting of Commonwealth leaders from the region. It exploded and killed three people. This um, was generally attributed to elements of the Ananda Marga sect, though the sect itself would always argue that they were rogue elements. I can remember uh, Andrew Peacock uh, banged on our door. Uh, it felt as if we'd been in an earthquake. Andrew said from the doorway, a bomb's gone off. It was really a traumatic occasion. 30 years on, Malcolm Fraser has revealed that protesters may have inadvertently saved his life that night. They forced him to change which entrance he'd used to greet the visiting dignitaries, including the Indian Prime Minister. The rubbish tin that that bomb was meant to be in was only a few feet from where I would have been shaking Mirage Desai's hand. I would have been collateral damage. A planned leaders' retreat went ahead in the southern highlands, but under unprecedented security. The army was brought out and they were looking under in drains and under culverts and so on. Um, so Australia hadn't seen anything like that before. In 1978, Cabinet decided it was prepared to use force to subdue any future terrorist threats and ordered a wholesale review of Australia's security regime. That inquiry eventually led to the establishment of the Australian Federal Police. The federal Government, I think, wanted to have more direct control rather than relying on state police forces. The Cabinet papers reveal that throughout 1978, security agencies kept a close watch on the Anandamaga, fearing the Indian sect had decided on a possible long-term campaign for revolution in Australia. When Federal Parliament sat for the first time after the bombing, security was tight, and so were the purse strings of the Fraser government. The Fraser government had won the December 77 election very convincingly, but it wasn't by any means a bed of roses. You've got 7% unemployment, 7% inflation, and a very large budget deficit. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand up to revive us again. Unemployment queues were long, jobs were scarce, and the Cabinet papers show the new Treasurer was extremely worried. To me, 1978 is the year of the emerging John Howard. The Cabinet 1978 is characterised by John Howard regularly reading a riot act to Parliament in really very strong submission, saying, we are heading disaster, you have got to cut spending back. John Howard's first budget was highly unpopular, even after its convincing 1977 election win, the Fraser government was still haunted by the big spending of the Whitlam years. And some see lessons for Kevin Rudd in similarly tough economic times. The, the 
next few years are going to, I believe, be reminiscent of the late 70s and early 80s where revenues weren't pouring into the coffers of government. Um, Governments had to be frugal and had to make their choices very, very carefully. Once you build in those growing social expenditures um, in health, education and welfare, and if you build in middle class welfare in particular, then it's going to be very hard to return a deficit budget to to surplus. Diplomats reported to Cabinet in 1978 that there was an atmosphere of disenchantment and bitterness among Asian leaders, partly because of Australia's trade policies. Australia's image in Asia was terrible. Um, complaints about Australia being uh, introverted, you know, insular in its attitude, um, case of Indonesia insensitive to Indonesian concerns. Australia's relationship with Indonesia had been strained by President Suharto's brutal invasion of East Timor. In 1978, Andrew Peacock warned that Indonesia's patience was running out with Australia's attitude and Cabinet decided it was time to recognise Jakarta's claim over East Timor by finalising negotiations over seabed boundaries in the Timor Gap. I guess it's an example of real politic as it was seen at the time. I mean, Whitlam basically took the same attitude. Um, Indonesia is a huge nation. We can't afford to get them offside. It is an example where, um, I guess, phrases humanitarianism had its limits. I think that it's an area where we have nothing to be proud of. In 1978, Cabinet was also grappling with the issue of so-called boat people, the armada of refugees escaping from Vietnam's communist regime. After several boats arrived in Darwin, the Immigration Minister Michael McKellar told Cabinet it was possible hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese could end up seeking a new home in Australia. There was quite an atmosphere of crisis. The government looked at some pretty draconian options, things like setting up um, detention camps as a, partly as a deterrence, turning the boats back, cutting back on entitlements for refugees. But the Fraser government rejected all those options. There was no need to treat people harshly in the way it's occurred more recently. It's to Malcolm Fraser's credit that he appealed to the best instincts in the Australian people and succeeded. 1978 was the year the Northern Territory was granted self-government and some believe the seeds were sown then for the Indigenous intervention 30 years later. The Commonwealth left the Northern Territory with a capital works backlog with an inadequate system of um, health, education and welfare and I don't think the Northern Territory has ever been able to catch up and I suppose the intervention under the Howard government was a mark of that very long period of failure. The federal government treated us like children in terms of handing over real responsibility. If the federal government had either retained sole responsibility for Aboriginal matters or given sole responsibility to the Territory, either of those solutions, I believe, would have been better. There were justifiable fears that if the Northern Territory had total uh, state-type powers that they may well have abused them. I wish to inform the House... The Fraser government ended 1978 behind in the polls, but it would be another five years before Bob Hawke would unseat Malcolm Fraser and take over the top job. The Fraser government in a lot of ways continued to struggle. It won the 1980 election, but quite narrowly. Never quite got the economy under control. It fell into recession. By 83, it had well and truly run out of puff. The early 70s were times of great and enormous extravagance. Uh, Commonwealth expenditures were out of control. Uh, World economies were also in very real difficulty. It was the year, I think, when we began to get on top of the economic problems that had occurred. You know, by the end of 1978, um, we'd made quite significant progress. Daniel Parry with that report.